One thing all art teachers can agree on is that we never have enough time for our own personal art. We spend all day and all year planning lessons for young artists and we give our best ideas away. One of the best things about summer break for me is that I have time to create art for me. Just pieces of art that I feel like making, pieces of art that have nothing to do with teaching or the classroom. So this video is one of my favorite things to do and that's to paint pet portraits. I think they make really great gifts, I think they're lots of fun, and a watercolor pet portrait is the perfect way to express myself without stressing. So in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about my process with this German Shepherd Puppy watercolor painting, but mostly, I'm just going to paint. Thank you so much for watching, and if you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button and support my channel. As far as materials, I am using my Arches Cold Press Watercolor Paper, and I'm taping the edges with plain old masking tape. And I love a taped edge when doing watercolor painting because it just gives this clean, crisp edge when you rip the tape off, which will be my last step. I'm using two different size round watercolor paint brushes and I prefer that for the nice point. I'm using my favorite travel palette which is my Winsor Newton and I'll put all of the links to my materials in my description box. This is my favorite palette by far. So to start with watercolor, um, you can put a little container of water in your palette itself and I'm going to be mixing a lot of my colors on the top palette where the lid closes. So I always start with an underpainting. And when I'm doing pet portraits, I usually stick to my earth colors. So you are going to see me start using burnt sienna. I'm gonna use a lot of burnt or raw, raw umber, not burnt. And I'm going to be using a lot of yellow ochre. So earth colors are the way I start. And an underpainting is a sketch. And notice I'm not using a pencil. Um, I prefer to sketch with my paint. And what you're doing is you're looking for the shapes, you're looking for the light and dark areas, and you're mapping out your composition. My portrait today is of a German Shepherd puppy named Libby. And Libby belongs to one of my students, Vincent. So I had students at the end of the year post in my Google Classroom their pets, and I told them I would pick a couple to create pet portraits. So I know I said this had nothing to do with teaching or school, but I guess it's hard to separate um, hard to separate being a teacher even in the summer. So what you see me doing here is mapping out how the photograph that Vincent sent me fits in the frame of my painting. So I'm looking at like how close the ears are cropped. Then if you'll notice the left side, left side of my painting, I'm cropping the puppy so you, you know, his body kind of goes off the edge. Once I have an area of color layered, I'm going back in and I'm darkening my areas, looking at the shadows of my photograph. With my underpainting, you can see I'm not using a lot of colors. I'm switching between my burnt sienna, which is that warmer color, and my raw umber, which is more of a darker, cooler brown. So I'm using umber to create my darker areas, and then the base of everything is the burnt sienna. Don't worry, I'm going to be mixing and adding more colors later, but your underpainting is all about composition, shape, size relationships, and how your puppy has areas of value or light and dark. You may notice that this watercolor palette does not have black. And believe it or not, there are so many artists and painters who are against using black in a painting. And so my favorite dark is mis mixing this ultramarine blue with my burnt umber. Look at that gorgeous color. So you might be wondering, how are you gonna paint a dog that's mostly black if you're not even using black on your palette? And the reason why artists and painters typically stay away from black is it can muddy up your colors and flatten or gray them out. So mixing opposites, so you could mix two colors that are opposite on the um, color wheel. So by using this kind of oranges burnt umber and then mixing the blue, those two complement complementary colors create a really gorgeous dark area. Another thing about painting with watercolor is the use of white. 
look how I'm using a paper towel to pull or leave my paper showing. So in watercolor, you want to leave the white of your paper to create your pure white areas. Now you'll see there is white on my palette and I am going to use it. I know a lot of watercolor artists are against using white, but not this art teacher. I think it's too much fun to mix some neutral grays and leaving the white of your paper is great, but this is a really good way to control your areas of light that aren't pure white. I'm going back with yellow ochre and I'm looking at my photograph to create areas that have a little bit more warmth to them, but a little bit more yellow as well. So I'm gonna pop my reference photo up in the corner so that you can see as I'm working. And at this point, I'm just trying to find my areas of dark, my areas of light, and I'm also looking for areas that are warm and areas that are cool. So with a very simple earth color scheme, you're looking for those things always. Where are the lights? Where are the darks? Where are the colors the most warm? And where are the colors most cool? So the tongue in this photograph, as you can see, is just adorable. And so I pulled away some water and paint so I could create this gorgeous, adorable puppy tongue. And I'm gonna let it dry and I'll go back and add detail later. I'm using the same very light wash of this red color to create that warm area in the ears. So as you can see right now, my puppy looks pretty much like a blob. And so with watercolor, layering your details are gonna be super important. It's time to go back in with my smaller brush and I'm mixing that really gorgeous dark value I created. And I'm looking in the photograph for the darkest areas and I'm not outlining. I'm just looking for my areas of dark. You'll see me kind of go back and forth between dark and light, warm and cool throughout this whole painting. Texture is obviously important when painting a pet portrait, and I'm using my paintbrush to create fur-like areas so that my German Shepherd starts to look more three-dimensional and have that really beautiful texture that a puppy has. So on the edges of the puppy, it's most important that those lines look like fur and they're not too smooth. I'm still majorly focusing on my dark areas and with watercolor, layering is key. So once your paint dries a little bit, you can see how much darker it looks when you're layering your second coat. And this time I think I went a little heavier on the blue than the burnt umber and it's giving it that really beautiful, cool black color that this puppy Libby, Libby has. Pulling away color before it dries is also important if you wanna keep your areas light, which you do. You have white in your palette, but it's really not the same as keeping the white of the paper. So you can see I'm not committing too much to the facial feature details because the photo Vincent sent me, sent me is a little bit small and a little bit blurry. So the small details are gonna be kinda of hard to figure out. And so right now I'm focusing on building up the other like fur markings and where the tongue is. So the clear areas, I'm working on those first and then I'll kind of go back in and make sure the eyes and that sort of thing have the detail that they need. Still focusing on my darks because this is, I mean, it's mostly a black dog. However, I'm not painting it all one color or one value. I'm trying to pay attention to the slight variations of lights and darks and warms and cools. That's what, the fifth time I've said that, right? So that's how you paint, is looking for those areas to create a lifelike work of art. When painting a subject, like a pet portrait, you never want to neglect the background. So yes, Libby is what I'm painting, but she is sitting in a background, and I wanna keep it very ambiguous. So I'm not painting like a door or a field of grass. I just wanna add a little bit of colors in the same color family. So I'm mixing together this lighter blue with some of those earth colors that I already have. And I'm focusing on adding just some light and dark areas to give Libby um, some atmospheric space behind her without painting too many details. 
It's also important to avoid something called the halo effect. And that's when an artist separates the port or the, separates the subject from the background and there's like a white area around the portrait. So you can see that I used my brush and I made sure that background color went all the way into Libby. So it wasn't like, here's the background, here's the subject, but the two areas are in the same space. So they would interact with each other as far as color, reflected light and shadow. Look at how much of a difference that second layer of yellow ochre warmed up Libby. So German Shepherds, and I actually have a German Shepherd, his name is Bird and he's laying right by my feet right now. They have a lot of dark areas. Um, Libby has very similar coloring to my dog, but the light areas, the yellow and the tan is really dominant as well. To darken up my darkest value, I'm adding a little bit of this red. I believe it's a lizard and crimson, but I need to go check my colors. And that's going to react with the blue to give it a really dark violet. So I'm going to use this value, this color, for the darkest, darkest, darkest areas. And I'm not using it necessarily to outline, but to find those darkest edges to make the facial features stand out. To truly get your darkest effect, you wanna do this with wet paint on a dried area. So you want your background to be dry enough that it's not gonna bleed into your pre-existing areas, but the lines that you draw, you're using a little bit of water, of course, but mostly paint so that that area stays really thick and it doesn't blend and flow into your other washes. So you want your fur to be pretty dry or all the way dry at this point. Time to give those adorable puppy paws some attention to detail. And it is a little tricky. I think sometimes painting the feet can be more challenging than painting the face. And so I'm using my reference image, which you can see in the corner, to map out the toenails and again, the areas of light and the areas of dark without just outlining it. I'm now gonna pay attention to the facial features details and I'm mapping in a small pupil and some details in the eye. I'm gonna try and get the nose in the right place. And my advice would be if you're at this point and you're feeling a little lost or overwhelmed, put your portrait up somewhere where you can look at it and then walk away and then do something else. And when you walk in the room and look at it again, you're gonna notice things that you didn't notice before. That's exactly what I just did. And you see how it's more dry. And when your painting is dry, it's going to layer color better. You can see how the pink on the tongue is standing out and it's not gonna bleed into the other colors because they're already dry. So take a picture of your work of art and look at it put it up and walk away. And you don't have to finish with this in one day or one sitting. I worked on this for three days and I worked on it for, I don't know, maybe two hours broken up over the course of three days. Look how much darker that looks next to the tongue because the value that I've already painted is dry. So now I'm really paying attention to those details and I'm trying to go slow and trying to really make Libby look like Libby and not just kind of a smushy ghost of a dog.
I'm going back into the face with my yellow ochre to see if I can make those distinctive tan markings pop and to create a little bit more um, interest in the face since I've been focusing so much on that dark value. I'm doing the same in the chest and the legs and I've kind of avoided that area because it's a really important part of the painting and sometimes I kind of avoid an area that needs a lot of definition. And you can see I wasn't kidding about the layering. This is what, the fourth, maybe fifth time I've gone into that tongue. And not all watercolor paintings have to be super layered. I love quick watercolor paintings that are like wet on wet and they're just quick sketches or really loose paintings. But my focus here was to create a lifelike, I mean, not photorealistic, but I want this to look like a German Shepherd and I want it to look like Libby, my student's dog. So when you're doing a work of art out of watercolor, it's very similar to acrylic or oil in the fact that you certainly can layer to create those areas. Now I'm finally adding white and you're gonna notice that the white dries gray. So they're pure highlights in the eye and the nose. I'm gonna try really hard to keep those the way they are, but I'm using the white to create areas of gray and then when it dries, you can paint back over it and have a little bit more control of your painting. Check out that highlight on the tongue, right? And keep in mind that a German Shepherd has white in their fur as well. So it's not pure white, but it has this gray lightness to it that I think the white captures perfectly. I don't always use white in my paintings, but I always use white in my pet portraits because it allows me to really, um, to layer color in a way that I feel like gives me more control. As my layers are drying, you can see what I mean about the white. It does not appear as light as it did when you paint it. Everything dries a little darker. So I really like to use the white for layering because it's not pure white like if you were using acrylic or using oil paint. 
So at this point, I let things dry again and I found my tiny little brush that I forgot I had in my studio. And this brush is gonna help me nail those tiny details that I've been avoiding in the face and in the feet to make this truly a portrait of Libby. So really, I know at the beginning I said I was only using two brushes, but I am gonna use a third detail brush that I'm so glad that I found because this painting is tiny. And the reason why I'm doing it so small is my photograph was small. So I didn't think it made sense to do a really large painting or even a medium sized painting when my reference image was so small. Now, if I was painting my dog in real life, this would be a huge painting because he's gigantic and he'd be right in front of me and I could see every detail in real time. There are limitations to using photographs um, because it's just a moment in time. The lighting doesn't change. It's just one snapshot but it's also hard to get an animal to sit still. So there is no shame in using a reference image, especially if you're just starting out or learning. It's always better to look at something than nothing when you're creating a portrait. So I'm loving the control of this brush. I'm overlapping and layering. Nothing's really changing all that much, but you'll start to see the painting really tighten and come to life once I let things dry and I'm going in with my tiny little detail brush to bring Libby to life. I'm really loving this layer of red that I'm putting in Libby's ears and tongue. I feel like it's warming it up just enough to give it that perfect, you know, eye-catching quality without taking away from the other details. So I'm making a neutral shadow with a little bit of burnt umber, a little bit of my blue, and a little bit of alizarin crimson. So you can see it's a really like grayed out purple. And I'm using that as a shadow underneath the feet and um, bottom of Libby. So it looks like she's not just floating, but there's like a cast shadow reflecting um, on the surface that she is sitting on. I'm starting to feel pretty finished, but I'm looking for areas that I can lighten up to create more contrast and to create more detail um, and to make Libby look even more alive. So you can see the eyes are starting to pop out a little bit. That nose has that nice shine to it. So it's always difficult to know when you're finished. And that's a question that I really never have the answer for. Sometimes I think I'm finished and I might work on it for even five minutes the next day. Um, but my last step is usually bumping up the highlights. So whether it's a painting or you know a drawing even, I think a really good last step for any work of art is to play around with your lights and your darks. And that doesn't mean that everything's black and white, but the areas that are really light, I think it just makes it look more three-dimensional and just stand out if you give it one last attention to detail before you call it finished. I could paint and work on this all day. I could come back to it every day forever. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist and I tend to overwork things. So knowing when to stop is something I struggle with. So I'm gonna continue painting for a little bit longer until I just tell myself it's time to move on.
Hey, I'm feeling good. I think I captured her likeness. You wouldn't mistake it for a photograph, but it does have that level of realism I was going for. Peeling the tape is so satisfying, and I will say my water bled a little bit. That's because I use masking tape instead of artist tape, but it still gives it a cool effect. Okay, Libby, you're such a good girl. Here's my finished German Shepherd watercolor puppy portrait. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening about my personal art making process. If you're interested in more painting tutorials, I've got you covered. I have tons on my channel and check these out if you're interested in doing some painting yourself.